That's what we're talking about in the numerical method. It's eight specific steps, and we're going to do this process with a photophosphorylation, which is using light to make ATP. So remember back in respiration, we used substrate level phosphorylation, which is using an enzyme to make ATP, and we used oxidative phosphorylation, that's when we're doing phosphorylation in the mitochondria by using ATP synthase. Now we're using the energy from the light to phosphorylate ADP into ATP, so we call this photophosphorylation. So here is the whole process all laid out. We're going to start over here with step one, we'll work our way all the way across to step eight. It's not as bad as it looks. We're going to go through it nice and slow, or at least relatively slow. So the first thing I want to point out before I say anything about the process is that the names for these steps are my names for them. They're just names that describe what happens to us. They're not official names. Other people or textbooks might break them down into more than eight steps or fewer than eight steps because it's you know, people and we like to categorize things. But these are ongoing processes. I have to break down these names into a simple set of steps. At no point in the process does the, does the system go through a step and pause because that step is done. Okay, now we go to the next step. I'll pause and that step is done. Just keep in mind it's, it's a continuous, ongoing process. We're breaking it down into steps to make it easy to understand, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the reality of how the process works. It's ongoing, it's continuous. So just keep that in mind as we go. So first step, photon absorption. Pretty straightforward. Chlorophyll molecule absorbs a photon of light, passes that energy to P68. So this starts in photosystem two. This is confusing because we would start with photosystem one. Photosystems one and two are so easy because that is the order in which they were discovered. It was only later that people figured out that photosystem two actually comes first in this process. So that's why it's confusing. So a uh, photon hits a pigment in photosystem two, one of these pigments in the light harvesting complex. The energy from that photon is passed along the molecules in that complex. Electrons aren't moving yet. The way uh, the textbook describes this energy movement, it's like a wave in a stadium. It's just adjacent molecules get excited with the energy, and that energy moves to the next one in line. So we're able to pass the energy down the chain. Ultimately, that wave will make it to P680 right here, which will become excited. Okay, so that's the first step. We take a photon in, and that energy move, makes its way through the light harvesting complex the P680 chlorophyll in the reaction center complex. Step number one. I want to emphasize here, no redox reactions yet. Haven't passed any electrons yet. But that's in the next step. Now we have our first redox reaction. Because in step two, the excited electron in P680 is transferred up to the primary electron acceptor in the reaction center. P680 is oxidized in this process, it loses an electron, so we now call it P680 plus because it has a positive charge, because it has lost an electron. The primary electron sector, therefore, is reduced. So we have a redox reaction here. The primary acceptor is reduced, P680 is oxidized. So our first redox reaction is of the Step number three is a very important step. Step number three is H2O oxidation. So this is where we're actually using the water that is on the reactant side of this equation. Because now we have a hole in here. P680, this P680 plus is missing an electron. And this system can't work while that's the case. So we need to refill that slot for electrons in P680. P680 plus is an extremely strong oxidizing agent. So strong, in fact, it can rip an electron away from water. It does this through a process called photolysis, which light breaking, you break that word down, because the energy for this process is ultimately coming from light. So P680 can break a water molecule in two, steal an electron, and that will fill the hole that was left when that electron was transferred to P680 plus. That proton, <coughs> that results, because you're also going to get a proton off of the water molecule when you do this, that proton gets released into the bilocoid space 
and that will come into play later. We want protons in trilocoid space. We'll talk about why it fails. When this happens, P680 plus is reduced back to P680. Now the system is reset. So this can absorb more protons, and this other electron is ready to go again. And as a result, oxygen is released as a byproduct, which is the waste product. Splitting water, stealing electron, oxygen results. This is the part of the process where oxygen is generated. So this is where atmospheric O2 comes from. It's this very early stage of photosynthesis. Because we're using water for electrons, and as a result, releasing oxygen gas. Okay. So now, so far, we're three steps in. We have captured a photon, we have transferred that energy in the form of an electron, and we have recovered that electron by splitting water. This is all taking place in photosystem two. The fourth step is the electron transport chain, one of several electron transport chains. So the electron from the primary <coughs> electron acceptor right here will go through the electron transport chain. And it will end up making its way all the way to PS1, photosystem one. We'll talk about that towards the end of the process, the fate of this electron. In the process of going through this electron transport chain, it goes through several carriers. And just like the electron transport chain we saw in mitochondria, this is just a series of redox reactions. The electron gets accepted and then it gets donated. Accepted, donated. So it's a redox series. The Unfortunately, the molecules involved in this electron transport chain are uh, a little more complicated to remember than the simple 1, 2, 3, 4 from the mitochondria. But these are called plastoquinone, cytochrome, com cytochrome complex, and plastocyan. The important one for us is the cytochrome complex because that cytochrome complex is pumping protons. It's establishing a proton gradient. And what do we do with the proton gradient? Make ATP, so that'll be the next step. Make it ATP, because we just made a proton gradient. This is very similar to mitochondria. Instead of pumping protons into the intermembrane space, we're pumping protons here into the thylakoid space, that innermost chamber, that innermost compartment of the chloroplast. So now, we use the cytochrome complex to generate that gradient, and we can let those protons diffuse back through ATP synthesis, just like we did during our respiration. And in the process, we're going to make a whole lot of ATP. And this is the step where you get the ATP from the light reactions, the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis. This is where we get our ATP. So now we're through five steps. We have three steps left. And we still need to make NADPH. And that's where photosystem one comes into play. So now we have to change, now we have to change gears a little bit because we're going to bring in photosystem one over here. Very similar in structure to photosystem two, slightly different pigment in the reaction center, P700 versus P680, but the same general idea of what's going on. So we have first light will enter the system again. So that second photon that comes in, and just like over in photosystem two, it will strike one of the pigments in the light RB2 <coughs> complex, and that energy will eventually be transferred up to P700 in the reaction center complex. So light in, energy transferred, just like last time. And just like last time, that P700 is going to lose electron, and therefore become <coughs> oxidized to P700 plus, the primary electron acceptor becomes reduced, so there's another redox reaction that's powered by light energy. That's the second one, when the energy has come from light. And then, just like before, you need to fill that hole that was left empty by the electron. That comes from the electron transport chain from photosystem two. That now is a pleated electron that has gone through the cytochrome complex and generated a bunch of protons. That electron that is now a low energy electron comes back into P700 plus and resets it to P700. That's the fate of the electron from photosystem two. So you can see a little bit right now what we call this linear electron flow. The electron starts over here, 
ends up over here. We put a new electron into the system on that side. Over here now, we have an electron that is found to be now reduced primary electron acceptor. So there is a second electron transport chain, and that electron gets passed down that chain. This one's a little bit different. It's not used to pump protons, and therefore it's not used to make ATP. It's a different set of molecules over here. It ends up, the electron ends up at a molecule called ferrodoxin, abbreviated FD. And ferrodoxin, well, we'll get ferrodoxin in a second. But first, no ATP. No proton gradient, no cytochrome complex, and not make any change on this side of the process. So this electron transport chain, same general structure, a little bit shorter, a little bit simpler, different destinations. Final step in this process is NADPH synthesis. So we have that electron transferred to paradoxin. Paradoxin transfers that electron to NADP loss resulting in NADPH. That NADPH is going to be needed for, for carbon fixation, so it gets released into the stroma of the chloroplast, where the Calvin cycle takes place. This reaction is catalyzed by NADP plus reductase, which is one of those big enzyme complexes that has a whole lot of polypeptide chains. This guy right here. So the FD will pass the electron down to NADP plus, which will react with a proton and an electron to form NADPH. That reaction is catalyzed by NADP plus reductase. I like it when the enzyme names tell you exactly what it does. NADP plus reductase reduces NADP plus to NADP. So those are the eight steps of linear electron flow. Let's summarize linear electron flow somewhat briefly. Starts with photosystem 2 absorbing light. The energy from that light will excite an electron in the 680, and that electron will get passed to the primary electron acceptor. That primary electron acceptor will send the electron down the electron transport chain. Just like the ETC in mitochondria, <coughs> this ETC generates a proton gradient. And as a result, ultimately generates ATP. Using ATP synthase and chemiosmosis, very similar process. The P680 will recover that electron. The P680 plus will recover that electron by splitting water and liberating oxygen. That's again where our atmospheric oxygen comes from. So that's a really important step in the process for the history of life on Earth. And on the other side, photosystem one absorbs light. The energy from that light will excite an electron in P700. That electron gets donated to the primary electron acceptor in photosystem 1, which will go down the photosystem 1 electron transport chain, ultimately ending with NADP plus reductase and generating NADPH. So the NADP plus in this process is the terminal <coughs> electron acceptor, the final destination for the electron that is ejected from photosystem 1. Again, happens because it absorbs light energy. And finally, that electron from photosystem two is what reduces P700 plus back to P700. So this is linear electron flow. And this is the primary process through which chloroplasts make ATP and NADPH for carbon fixation reactions. Because you need a lot of energy for those reactions. This is where they end. Carbon fixation is a lot simpler. Don't worry. Before we get to carbon fixation, we'll talk very briefly about cyclic electron flow. Cyclic electron flow, like linear electron flow, is light dependent, but only photosystem one is involved. We're not using photosystem two. It's a little bit different in terms of the electron transport chain. The way this works is P700 will absorb a photon. The electron will go to the primary electron acceptor in PS1. Ferrodoxin, but ferrodoxin, instead of going to NADPH reductase, NADP plus reductase, will go the other way, over to the cytochrome complex. And then that electron, after it goes down the ETC involving the cytochrome complex, will return back to P700. So in cyclic electron flow, 
between 700 and loses an electron, and then at the end of the process, gains that electron back. So there's no terminal electron acceptor. There's no source of electrons. It's one electron just cycling through the system. This movement, of course, through the cytochrome complex generates a proton gradient, so we are making ATP in this process. But unlike linear electron flow, we are not making NADPH. We're cutting out that part of the process over here. So light comes in, pass your electron to the primary electron acceptor, ferrodoxin, down through the cytochrome complex, and the part of the uh, photosystem 2, as you see, if you want to think about it that way, but then goes right back to P700 plus and resets the system that way. There's no terminal electron acceptor, so you're not making any, any NADPH, and there's no electron donor in the form of water. You're not splitting water to get an electron back into the system, so you're not releasing any oxygen in cyclic electron flow. No source or terminal electron acceptor. So we're just going to compare these very briefly. Keep in mind that compare and contrast is also an outcome on your biostorms. So linear electron flow versus cyclic electron flow. Both require light. So both part of the light dependent reactions <coughs> photosynthesis. Linear involves photosystem two and then one. Cyclic is just photosystem one. One by electron flow is linear. The electron is cycled and cyclic. Things pretty much get that one way. Water is the electron source for linear flow. There's no electron source for cyclic flow. Similarly, NADP plus is the terminal electron acceptor in linear electron flow. There is no terminal electron acceptor in cyclic electron flow. Protons are pumped in bulk processes. ATP is made in bulk, but only linear electron flow gives you NADPH as well. So now we're going to talk very briefly about ATP synthesis, and then we will get to the carbon uh, so ATP is synthesized in both linear and cyclical electron flow. And you get the energy through the electron transport chain. Going through that cytochrome complex, you are generating a proton gradient. You're taking protons from the stroma and pumping them into the thylakoid space, into the innermost space of the, of the uh, chloroplast. As a result, you have an acidic pH in the lumen of the thylakoid, the thylakoid space and a somewhat basic pH, a weakly basic pH, in the stroma itself. So just like in mitochondria, you make a proton gradient, the protons diffuse through the ATP synthase, and make ATP as a result. So this is chemiosmosis. But in mitochondria, the energy for chemiosmosis came from breaking down food. That's where we got our high energy electrons, how the electron transport chain. In this version, the energy comes directly from the light. So we're using light to make ATP. That's why we call this photophosphorylation. I'm going to skip this slide because we don't have time for it. I skipped it yesterday. So don't worry about that slide. I just want to show you the picture version. <laughs> this diagram I really like because it shows you where there's a high concentration of protons and the direction of proton movement to make ATP. So here we have the mitochondria, and it's the intermembrane space where we have the protons that are diffusing into the matrix. Here, it's a little bit different because the protons are building up within the thylakoid membranes, and then they are diffusing back into the stroma to make ATP. The direction of that diffusion is really important in the chloroplast because we need those products directly, and they need to be on the right side of the membrane. So don't worry about all of the stuff that's going on. We've already talked about these processes. The main thing I want to show you here is here's the inside of the thylakoid space. Here's the stroma. When you make NADPH, it's on the stroma side of the membrane. When you make ATP, the chemiosmosis, the ATP is formed on the stroma side of the membrane. 
And that's really important because in the stroma, that's the location of carbon fixation. So those materials that are needed to power the Calvin cycle are directly able to do so without having to cross a membrane. And remember, when we talked about respiration, one of the stages in these processes when you use efficiency is in getting things across the membranes. So that's important. So now that brings us to carbon fixation. The whole point of carbon fixation is taking the gas in the atmosphere, fixing it into big macromolecules. This, of course, requires energy in the form of ATP and NADPH. Here's the equation that we're talking about here. 6CO2 plus a whole bunch of energy molecules, NADPH and ATP, give you C6H12O6, one molecule of glucose, plus the spent forms of the energy molecules, NADP plus, ADP, and inorganic phosphate. And then you get water over here too, and that is important because this reaction going from CO2 to C6H12O6, that is using the dehydration reaction. And when you combine things using the dehydration reaction, you release water. So that's why in that big initial equation I showed you, there's water on both sides. You take in water and use it during light-dependent reactions, but you also create some water during carbon fixation because you're doing dehydration reactions to combine smaller things into bigger things. There are several types of carbon fixation reactions, but the primary one that plants do, the one we're talking about, is the Calvin cycle. That's the one that's used by most plants. So the Calvin cycle just takes in the energy molecules from the light-dependent reactions plus CO2, and you get big carbon macromolecules out of it. Now we're going to go through the steps of this process. So if you're going to simplify it, don't worry. So this process does not directly require light energy, but it requires the results of the light-dependent reactions. You need ATP and NADPH to carry out this reaction because it's endergonic and you require the reducing energy of, A, of NADPH. So there are 13 reactions in the Calvin cycle. Each of them has its own specific enzyme. So we're not going to talk about all 13 steps. We're going to talk about what goes in, we're going to talk about a few of the intermediates, and then we'll talk about what goes out. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing. There are three phases to this process. And rather than knowing 13 reactions, you need to know the three phases. The three phases are carbon fixation, reduction, and RUBP regeneration. RUBP is basically, if you think back to the citric acid cycle, remember how oxaloacetate was that carbon molecule that kind of circulated within the cycle? You used it at the beginning and then to reform it at the end? That's what RUBP is. You bind carbon to it at the beginning, and then you have to reform RUBP at the end. So here we go. First phase, carbon fixation. You're taking your RUBP, which is a five carbon sugar, ribulose, with two phosphates on it. So this phosphate, that's how you have the name RUBP. You're adding to that CO2. You're going to do this, uh, this reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme Lubisco, which is by mass, one of the most common enzymes on Earth because chloroplasts are chock full of Lubisco because this reaction is happening all the time in all photosynthetic organisms. And you end up with a six carbon compound. So you have a five carbon compound, taking CO2, six carbon compound. That is carbon fixation. You have fixed carbon. But this six carbon compound is unstable. So it splits into two three carbon compounds called phosphoglycerate. Okay, so we have five plus one makes six, and that splits in half into three and three. First step of this process. We can show that graphically. There's that figure of the whole cycle. So you have your RDBP that's circulating within the cycle. CO2 comes in, and your six carbon compound, which then splits. Okay, so that's the carbon fixation step of this process. The next two steps I'm going to show you together because so we have PG that gets reduced to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. That's the reduction step. And this should look familiar to you. Glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. That's one of the intermediates from glycolysis that you need to know. 
And that's important because glycerol I3 phosphate is actually useful for plants. They can build stuff from it. So that's still a three carbon molecule, but it is a different one. It's a rearranged three carbon molecule. It costs energy to do this. So because it's reduction, you can use the NADPH. And since you added, uh, you actually put in the energy from ATP as well. <coughs> So from glyceraldehyde three phosphate, you can do two things. You can reform RUDP, right? That's the RUDP regeneration part of the cycle. The alternative is to make sugar. You can take glyceraldehyde three phosphate out of the cycle and turn that into something else. Take two G3Ps, you can combine them into glucose. You basically just run glycolysis backwards and you get glucose. So here's the second half of the cycle. We have our PG that came in from our carbon fixation step. We <coughs> use ATP and NADPH, oops, sorry, to reduce it down to G3P. We can take G3P out of the cycle, or we can use G3P to regenerate our RUDP to keep the cycle going. And there's our three steps, carbon fixation, reduction, and then regeneration. And that is the Calvin cycle. So here's a little thing. And I want to just point out the numbers here, because you're taking out a G3C, which is three carbons. So in order for this whole cycle to go, you need to put three CO2 molecules in. You make three of these six carbon compounds, rearrange them into six G3P molecules through reduction and the use of energy. So we're using ATP. So here we have reduction down to six G3P molecules. We use our energy to do that. We can take one of those G3Ps out, and with the remaining five left in the cycle, we can rearrange them back to RUDP, because we still have 15 carbons here. So we're just going to rearrange them. Instead of five molecules of three, three molecules of five. And now the cycle can start again. We can put three more CO2 in. Two turns of this cycle get two G3Ps, which allow you to get one glucose molecule out. That is carbon fixation. I told you it was shorter and simpler than the light reactions. We can simplify it even further, we just want to know the numbers. Three CO2 in, 18 carbons here, take three out, 15 carbon cycling. 15 cycling, three in, three out. Just like respiration, it might be helpful to count carbons just to keep track of it. Recommend Five plus one gives you six, that's six. As I said, it's unstable, so it splits. You take one 3C out, and the rest will be rearranged back to five carbon RUDP. This uses ATP and NADPH from the light-dependent reaction. So I emphasize that. This reaction requires a whole lot of energy to accomplish. So that's why those products from the light reactions are so important. So I wanted to return to this, as I said we would at the end. So we saw water. Get split in the light dependent reactions. We're using the electrons and then we're releasing oxygen. CO2 is where our biomass actually comes from. So the carbon, the CO2, that plants are taking in ends up fixed in organic macromolecules like glucose. That's where the carbon comes from and where it goes. Along the way, we make water as a product through dehydration synthesis dehydration reactions. You're building up larger molecules, you're taking water out of them, and that's why we have water on both sides of the equation. So to summarize this very briefly, the light reactions. It's in the thylakoid membrane. The whole point is to convert light energy from photons into ATP and NADPH. And as a result, they release oxygen. The Calvin cycle reactions take place in the stroma. They're going to use the energy ATP and NADPH to generate G3P from CO2. And that G3P can be used to make other things down the road. And we're going to return the ATP and NADP plus to the light dependent reactions so they can be reduced and phosphorylated again for the next cycle. So that is photosynthesis. Next time. We're going to change gears entirely from what we've been talking about, which is that three lectures on energetics, metabolism, energy cycling. Now we're going to get more cellular, and starting next week, 
and we'll talk about the cell cycle. Oh Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.